Welcome everyone, welcome to Tour de Moon, which is a new nationwide festival taking place in the summer 2022, uh, all over England and beyond in multiple satellite uh, location. We are, uh, well, we are aiming to prompt radical imagination by looking at the moon, looking at the moon as a character and as a landscape. With, uh, the girl that has named herself Kate. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Uh, so yes, radical imagination in places using the moon as a landscape and as a character to kind of like inspire us, but also in ways and means that we can collaborate with the moon. So we are using things like moon bounce, for example, which is a technology that allow you to actually send signal onto the moon three meter in the moon and the moon basically react and respond and send a signal back. And what she sent back is pretty exceptional, everyone, but it's nothing like Maya Carey singing a Christmas tune and actually talking about Maya Carey. We're gonna speak about Maya Carey right now uh, because well, Maya Carey, still a massive inspiration to all of us, also at Tour de Moon. Uh, you know, she came up with probably one of the best Christmas tune ever invented or not, who knows? We're gonna discuss this with our panelists today, whether or not Maya Carey Christmas song is a good one or not. Uh, they have a lot to tell us, so I'm not going to take too much time, uh, you know, to kind of uh, go through the, the basic, but what I want to show to everyone is just where everything is at. So we were talking about Tour de Moon, and I just really want you to see where you can apply currently to actually get grants creative grants to be a part of the festival. We are offering 25K, more than three different grants of 25K to actually make an immersive uh, film. We are also, you know, uh, 3,000 pounds, more than 16 uh, grants of, uh, of 3,000 pounds to make a short film. You can also develop a way to collaborate and enter conversation with the moon. You can also do digital work and memes. We've had lots of different talks. You can perform, you can do new plays. You can also be part of Moon Press and so many other things. But right now, we are here to speak about Christmas tune. And I am Nelly Benayun, and it's my greatest delight to welcome uh, all of our incredible guests to the floor. So for those of you that are and cannot see me, I am a little brunette. I have a big bright red lipstick or what is left of it after three hours of live streaming. <laughs> uh, I have, uh, you know, a lot of makeup and then some hoops and a lot of fake bling. Uh, do you want to tell us what you look like? Maybe we can start with Hugo, Hugo van der Perl. What do you look like? Uh, well, I just went to the hairdresser. So my hair is supposed to be kind of grayish. Um, I am wearing AirPods by Apple, which I don't know are if they are like a, a nice thing to wear, but I do. And I am wearing a leopard track suit. Legendary. And then we have Lisa here joining us as well. Lisa, what do you look like? Um, so I have long brown hair. I am wearing a black v-neck t-shirt and I'm uh, wearing a necklace, um, some makeup as well. Uh, that's what I look like. Thank you. And Olivia? Um, so I have dark brown hair, it's tied back at the moment, um, I'm wearing a purple shirt and I'm sitting at a desk uh, in my mom's spare bedroom in Cyprus right now. <laughs> <laughs> and welcome to the three of you. So let me quickly introduce you before we rock into the topic of today how to make a Christmas student like Maya Carey. And I know that Lisa, you have a presentation, so we're gonna start with you uh, in a second. So Lisa, let's start with you actually, introducing you. You're born and raised Brazilian DJ, producer, vocalist, and you've been taking over pretty much the entire of Amsterdam experimental club scene. This is you, Lisa, here we go. You are become a familiar face really of radical and underground club night as a DJ. And you've been performing with Mike Blanco and other like Sophie and beyond. Uh, you do many different things. You've been in multiple different clubs. And then finally you decide to actually take your music seriously. And back in 2016, you started to actually develop using lo logic, multiple different new uh, songs 
songs. I'm having a really long bio here, but I'm not going to go through everything. We're going to discover you through your presentation as well. We also have Olivia Melconian, who is also an incredible sound artist, DJ, and audio producer, raised between London, UK, and Georgia, UAE, and Georgia, 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 Georgia. Uh, yeah, and you have been uh, working on audio for over five years for many youth-led radio station, uh, and you're also a part of the Armenian Institute, and you realize that the power of recording um, is important in our existence, and you mix that with sound and analog visuals, and you try to use your music to actually develop act of revolution. And then now we also are being joined by Hugo Van de Perle. Well, if you're tired of talking to your therapist, then perhaps you should try Hugo Van de Pel because Hugo Van de Pel has got a new EP that he just released, which is a smoothing tunes for Christmas to try and like calm the air. Uh, and he sent it to me just about two days ago by complete joke. You know, it just happens that we were also running a session about Christmas tunes. And so it's uh, his way of trying to bring an uh, a beat version fighting against depression. Uh, and you're also a cultural programmer at ADE, Amsterdam Den 7th. I don't know if you still are or you will be, but uh, here you go. So this is exceptional to have you all three with us. Uh, the floor is all yours, Lisa, if you want to start and share your screen, show us what does it take to make a Christmas tune and whether or not Maya Carey is even a reference in that. Um, okay, hi everyone. So I'm Liza. It's great to be here with everyone. Um, so I got a pretty last minute request to be a part of this panel. So I kind of gave my own interpretation on the theme of how to make a Christmas tune like Mariah Carey. Um, as you can see here, I basically tried to go into um, what's behind having your song be known because um, as an artist, like your song doesn't just randomly end up on radio or your song doesn't just randomly end up in everyone's ears. So I basically wanted to give a um, mini kind of masterclass to like beginning artists who kind of want to find out or figure out how to kind of become a, a little bit more known uh, in the music industry. So who am I? This is my bio. We just talked about it. Um, I'm a music producer, I'm a singer songwriter, I'm a co-founder of a collective called Triple X. We run nightlife initiatives in Amsterdam focusing on um, intuitive and inclusive experiences for marginalized identities and I am a sound designer, um, have worked on multiple campaigns with Hugo Boss, Show Studio, um, have had my music played on radio, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think I definitely have some knowledge to share uh, with you on this, especially because all my previous releases have been uh, completely self-released. Uh, so basically just giving you some tips for artists here and who kind of wants to walk away from this presentation, just kind of knowing where to start and where to go. Uh, first part of the topics is we're gonna, I'm gonna tell you what your team should look like. Uh, second, how to build community. Three, gonna introduce some of you to the concept of an EPK. We'll explain later what that means. And fourth, I'm gonna go into Spotify, uh, which obviously it's, I know we're not all really big fans of that platform, but um, at the end of the day, it is one of the platforms that has been able to kind of forward shoot um, artists in really tangible ways. So. Um, first things first, your team as an artist and all the structures around it. So I have a screenshot here that I actually uh, screenshot it from a presentation that was given to me during the Shape Platform lectures because I was a artist during Shape Platform this year, which is a platform that basically just um, like, yeah, it's like funded by the European Union and they, they kind of help artists to develop certain things. Um, we had to do it all from home this time. Usually you go somewhere and you learn, but this time it was online, but I was able to screenshot the presentations and now show that to you. So um, in the middle we see here, you have an artist and I'm gonna mostly focus on the little bit that's people. Um, so as an artist, because you're an artist, you wanna focus on being able to do most of the creative things within your job. Um, 
if you want to focus on being solely the creative because you can't do everything on your own, even if you're an indie artist, uh, you're not signed, you do need people helping you with certain things. And one of the first people that I would say is the most important within your team is a music manager. Um, a manager, I'm pretty sure everyone knows what that entails. It's just someone that kind of talks to you about where you want to go in your career, what steps to take. They usually have contacts to agencies, publicists, lawyers, uh, and they help you kind of form your way through the music industry. Then secondly, you have an agent. So your agent is the person who is gonna help you perform. They have contacts with festivals, gigs, um, um, venues, and they basically help you actually get the music that you're releasing on a live platform. Then we have a publicist. Um, well, how are fans gonna learn about your music if they don't know about your name. This is where a publicist comes in because a publicist is a person who will have connections to magazines and blogs and even Spotify to actually help you get your name out there, get you interviews, get you whatever. Then lawyer and distributor. Um, and I know this is all very overwhelming. Um, when I first started out as a artist, I only had an agent for the longest time. Then eventually, because I was doing gigs, someone walked up to me and they were like, who does your management? And I was like, I don't have a manager. And then that became kind of a rolling thing. Um, but generally you would want to have these people in your team, a lawyer, obviously you shouldn't be signing any contracts with people without having an actual lawyer, look over them to protect yourself and your future interests. And then fifth is a distributor. Um, a distributor is someone who actually gets your music on streaming services and in online stores. Now you can get signed to a distributor, but my three releases that I've had, I just signed up to an online distribution um, platform like Lander. I know there's DistroKid as well. Um, and these distributors will make sure that your music gets on a streaming platform in stores where you can buy it, iTunes, Deezer, um, and they will make sure that you also get the money from your music being on these platforms. Um, so what I'm trying to say with this is, this is kind of the people that you should try to look out for. Um, and you will be able to find these people through, next part, building community. Um, I think a lot of artists sometimes think that um, overnight success is just something that happens to a lot of people. Um, but actually overnight, there's like a quote where they say that overnight success is usually 10 years of work in the making. Um, a lot of this work comes from building community and um, focusing mostly on the social platforms right now because we are in a pandemic and we can't really go out at the moment but there's really, really, really great ways to build community through social media platforms. Uh, you can do this by joining groups about electronic music. You can join Discord chats about electronic music. Um, I planned my first live show solely through just creating a community on SoundCloud, getting, um, getting familiar with different collectives in different cities and then just messaging them like, hey, trying to tour through Europe, like, is your collective doing a party? Let's let's put together something. Um, community at the end of the day is like one of the things that will propel you into these spaces where you will find a manager or where you'll find an agent um, by going through gigs from artists that you like or you enjoy. There's usually at least a few managers, at least a few publicists, at least a few agents in that crowd because they're scanning for new talent or they're just there because they were invited there by the agents of that artist. So um, finding ways to really kind of position yourself into these situations where you're going to be surrounded with people that are into the same thing as you is a really, really crucial step to actually being able to, um, to formulate your team. Am I going too fast? It's, I was told I had 15 minutes. So I wanted go to... ahead, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um, next step. EPK. Okay, everyone, this is so, 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 so important. This is one of the first things that you need to do if you're an artist that wants to 
get out and kind of get people to, to join their team or just get introduced to them. And it's an electronic press kit. An electronic press kit is basically a presentation like a Google slide or like a PDF or like a Word doc where you have a press picture of yourself, um, your artist biography. If you don't have an artist biography, you can easily write one for yourself by just kind of looking at other people's like Spotify biographies, or you can like maybe pay a friend that's that's doing like a journalism study, like a few bucks to like write one for you. Um, then any links to publish mixes or press that you already have. If you don't have any, like no worries, but it's always good to include these in your electronic press kit um, so that people can read up more on you from like an outside perspective. Um, links to any online content, then also your releases, if you have anything out, whether it be like uploads, anything on Spotify, any projects that you've worked on, um, gig highlights, so any gigs that were cool that you played that you were involved in and then contact information this is so people can contact you so an electronic press kit is very important because when you actually start making those moves towards wanting to join an agency or wanting to get a manager or meeting someone um, an epk is basically an artist's business card in some way um, usually people have websites or you know, something to kind of give people to introduce them to who they are. But when you're indie and you don't have money to build a website or uh, don't have money to print business cards, what you can do is get people's emails and then basically send them your electronic press kit. And your electronic press kit is basically the same thing as a curriculum would be, but just a little bit more creative to get people introduced to what you do and who you are. Um, and then the next thing, Spotify. And this is already for people who I guess are kind of releasing music or even if you wanna just release your first release. This is just some tips that I've kind of gathered within the last few years. Um, I've released three projects so far and all of them were self releases and I've been able to kind of learn with every release um, how to get more attention towards them. Um, so one of the first things that you should do if you're planning to release something, whether it be your first release or your second release, whatever, make playlists. So Spotify, they reward people who spend time on their platform. They're like super monopoly. They basically wanna know that you as an artist are encouraging other, like your fans to spend more time on their platform. So imagine you're gonna release something in the next three months make a playlist. It could be like Liza's gym playlist. And you can just add a few tracks that you listen to when you're in the gym, make sure to kind of add some more stuff as you're building up to your release, post about your playlist on your social medias. I'm sure you've seen a lot of artists kind of post about their Spotify playlist that you should listen to or like stuff like that. Um, what happens when you do this as an artist, Spotify will want to reward those artists more than they would others because they know that if they see you making playlists and actually getting your fans to spend more time on their platform, they're going to want more people to go to your profile because then they would stay longer on Spotify. <laughs> Is this making sense? It's like kind of a weird situation, but a lot of people get playlist placements because they have been active on Spotify. Um, with my last release, I made sure to make like a Liza essential. So like my essential tracks that I'm like, these are my tracks that you should know. And I did like a day to day playlist. And I think I had my release um, placed in I think 10 major Spotify playlists. And that was a really, really big difference from the previous one. Um, I'm talking about playlists as well because playlists are a really, really good way to get people introduced to your music because people, as much as we like to think we're free thinkers, the algorithm and playlists are ways for people to really kind of get curation on what is hot and what's fresh and what's interesting. Um, Spotify will also reward you in ways where they will send newsletters, basically being like, this person has released new music, or this is an up and coming artist to watch. Um, 
another way to get your music into playlists is by actually registering your music way in advance. So if you have your music up on uh, a distribution website, that will then be linked to your Spotify. So it will say that you have an upcoming release on your Spotify for artists, which is also a point that I have there. Um, if you haven't gotten into Spotify for artists yet, do, because it's basically a platform where you can look on over all your stats, um, see what's going on with your audience, where they're based, what their age is. And this will also really help you if you're um, trying to get an agent. You can be like, hey, I have like, 10,000 listeners in this city. I should be doing gigs here because I will sell out. Um, you can basically, on Spotify for Artists, you can pitch upcoming music to be in certain playlists as well. Um, and honestly, I hate that I even have to say all this stuff because it's like, why has music become this way, right? Like we should be, <laughs> we should just be releasing music and just like <laughs> let it do its thing. Um, but I think the time to basically relate it back to Mariah Carey, like the time that we're in today has completely changed from the time in which Mariah Carey was releasing her records. And it's mostly focused on um, streamings and playlists, et cetera. So that's why I'm honestly just giving you these tips just because I guess it's important. I don't necessarily like this, <laughs> but it is the, the, the cold heart truth. Um, so also keep your information updated, add a canvas to tracks. It's pretty easy to do that through Spotify for artists and add a nice profile picture and a banner. And then you should be set to kind of look like a professional artist that needs an agent and a team. Uh, amazing, Lisa. Thank you so much for this really in-depth, <laughs> uh, you know, how to practical list. And I'm going to actually ask Hugo van der Pel to chim in there because also you have done like really interesting like your music when you release it is actually on instagram so i don't know if you want to share your instagram just so we can kind of like i i guess we can speak about as well other platform because you mentioned spotify but maybe maybe we can start there as well about what does it take to actually release and like you mentioned lisa the release is a big part of it and the strategy behind the release is a big part of it and I wanted Hugo to come and present us his own way of sharing music because it's quite special, like from targeting on WhatsApp, his friends, <laughs> to uh, sharing on, do you want to take the microphone? Uh, any questions? Ooh. <laughs> We're going to get to the question in a second, Lisa. Right, I just added, I thought I was like the last person <laughs> to do yeah. the thing. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll get into that. Um, well, uh, same as uh, Lisa, I guess I'm uh, releasing, well, I'm releasing actually a lot of music, but I'm also doing all the roles that she described basically is just me. Um, but that has, I don't know, I really like that um, because I want to be independent and I want to do exactly what I do when I want to do it, how I want to do it. Um, so I'm not like the typical artist, I guess. Um, I think, well, to introduce myself, I'm Hugo. Um, I make music uh, under a lot of different kind of names. Um, in the Netherlands, I make uh, Dutch depressed songs to kind of wave music uh, under the name Stippelift, um, which is I've been doing for the past six or seven years, which is really great. And each year I've released a Christmas single and each year I've done a Christmas or a lot of Christmas shows actually. Um, so I want to uh, get into that a little more. Um, and I'm also um, making programs at uh, Amsterdam Dance Event uh, around a lot of things uh, related to arts and culture and electronic music. Um, so I'm kind of all over the place, um, but Christmas is a, is a big thing for me and also musically. Um, so um, I think, what I, what my takeaway is from Mariah Carey's um, extensive Christmas um, persona is, of course, uh, she makes a lot of money, um, but that's not super interesting to me. Well, could be, would be nice, but um, I think the main uh, thing is that Mariah was already kind of a, a big celebrity before she released All I Want for Christmas is You in 1994, which she uh, released in October. 
I think uh, she was one of nobody releases their Christmas music music in October. So I think that's that's the the number one takeaway. I've tried it actually, but it didn't work. Um, but it could be. But I think the 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 main interesting thing is that when you hear Mariah's Christmas music, it kind of reminds you just of Mariah Carey. So her kind of Christmas persona and her normal persona, which is kind of has disappeared a little bit because she's such a, a huge Christmas star, um, are kind of the same person. So if you find her Christmas music and listen to it and you listen to her regular music, um, it's kind of the, the same energy and the same Mariah. Um, so I think that's the main success of, of Mariah, um, in my opinion. Um, so I think in order to do this, any anyone could do this, any any artist um, in any way. Um, you do, that doesn't have to be music; could be also visual arts or whatever fine arts. Um, I think fine arts, Christmas arts would be also really nice if people release like Christmas artworks. But anyway, um, I think it's just really important to find your niche. And for Maria, her niche is millions of people. Uh, for me, my niche is kind of uh, a few thousand people maybe, or I don't know, a little more, but uh, not a lot. Um, and to really, um, of course, find your audience within that niche um, as an artist. And then for me, it's really fun to to add the, the Christmas on there as kind of a, a bonus thing, uh, if you like Christmas. Um, but it should be, of course, related to your practice as an artist. Um, for which worked out really great for Maria and also works out really great for me because um, usually I just release like an album each year. And then at the end of the year, I release maybe a Christmas album or a Christmas single, but sometimes it's just a song that I'll, I've already released and then I remake it into kind of a, a less depressing um, song for Christmas. But my niche actually is, is about kind of the, the dark side of Christmas being alone not wanting to be around people are you gonna share with us some of your because you know like they are quite unique your videos usually you know other one for christmas here we go so that's actually your where is it like you you have that amazing like you had that video as well last year and did you release a video for this year yeah it's it's um I'm you already passed it. it where is it which one is it it's on the right. It's uh, yeah. It's oh. two down. Two down on the right. Two down on the right. I'm just completely six. Next to Mariah. There you go. So this is a video I uh, actually made myself, um, but it's uh, with an artwork by uh, Bas Kosters, which is a really nice Dutch artist, and uh, he created uh, Spotty for me, which is a sad Christmas tree, and then I made a, a video around that um, to support my. Um, Christmas single, um, but so my niche is kind of actually uh, kind of um, hating Christmas, but loving it at the same time. And people are really into it. Um, the first time I released the Christmas song, it was about crying during Christmas and it got a lot of airplay and people were really into it. And actually it helped me uh, really broaden my, my, uh, um, my audience because a lot of people uh, um, found out about the music I was making through my uh, Christmas music, which is a little more, um, kind of upbeat than my usual music, which is kind of a little more serious and sad. Um, and then this year, because there's a pandemic going on for two years, I've really been making programs also with Nelly um, last October at ADE about um, kind of healing uh, instead of uh, celebrating. So um, the pandemic has kind of made everybody a little more like a shut in and a little more uh, depressed and and the the future is looking less bright than ever um, but I think it's really important for people to kind of look inwards and and find their strength and the hope and whatever in within themselves to kind of um, come to terms with the situation that's going on instead of fighting it um, so I started fighting it really badly uh, the first year of the pandemic um, I actually made like Gabber uh, hardcore music um, to um, make up for the fact that I couldn't go to a club. But now this year, um, finally, I've come to terms a little bit with the pandemic. And I thought to celebrate that, 
I wanted to make a meditative kind of uh, ambient music, um, which was new for me. And I started doing that and um, learned a lot about it and was very um, soothing for myself. And then I made an album, which is an hour long kind of meditation to find your inner Christmas spirit. Um, so it's really focused on Christmas as something personal and not something with a lot of obligations. Um, like Mariah is the happy-go-lucky kind of Christmas and I'm kind of the, I don't know, um, if you would like to have a nice Christmas by yourself kind of Christmas um, is what I'm presenting to the world. And I released this album two days ago and actually I've gotten really great responses and um, it's been a lot of fun. So I think uh, my my Mariah moment this year is that everybody should really focus on their on, on themselves and um, their own mental health. And um, so my Mariah energy is that I I uh, stay true to my audience, to my niche, to what I want to present as an artist, as did Mariah for so many years. And um, well, this year she kind of sold out. She made a campaign with McDonald's, which I really hated, but I uh, love her still. So that's kind of my um, Your sense on Mariah. Thank you so much, Hugo van der Perl, also known as Stephen Lift. Am I saying it right? Stephen Lift. Yeah, uh, great. And Olivia, Olivia, do you want to share with us, Olivia Melconian, everyone, do you want to share with us your journey through Christmas and Christmas tune and how you do Christmas tunes? Sure. Um, yeah, so I'm kind of coming at it um, from a different angle, I guess. Uh, it's quite an interesting way of, of talking about music and, um, you know, looking at how, how things get popular. Um, so I am, yeah, I'm, I'm working mostly in music as a, as a DJ, but also, you know, working in sound in, in different ways and working in, um, in production, in, in podcasting, in radio, and also just kind of, you know, like new ways of, of capturing sound and creating content that is, I guess, you know, it's both entertaining, it's something for yourself, it's documentation, it's archiving. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about like how I got into that and then kind of open it up as well to look at how you can break into these kind of industries that seem kind of like a little bit daunting and um, also, you know, goals for myself as well, you know, getting into music production and things like this that seem initially quite, uh, yeah, difficult to break into and like they require obviously a lot of time and um, building up skills and things like that. So I got um, into sound um, through university and through doing like a media production degree um, because it was something like I didn't even know that you could like have a career in sound I didn't even know it was an industry um, so it was really eye-opening to kind of um, be in like a learning environment um, where people were kind of encouraging it and especially like being a woman people were just like you know there's actually not a lot of women in this industry so it's kind of nice you know if you if you train in it and if you study in it, it's just like another way of, of diversifying the industry and bringing a new perspective to it. Um, and so I think you'll find like, or at least at kind of the base level, a lot of the kind of easier ways to get in, into sound um, physically are like through radio. So there's a lot of, of radio stations, you know, locally and um, in big cities and small cities and now there's like a huge rise in internet radio um, which is like a really great opportunity for people to practice like a bunch of different skills you can go into like radio production which is not necessarily like you know software music djing at all it's like scheduling and uh, taking care of guests and um, djs and things like that um, and then you can also get into hosting and DJing and it's a great way to like practice mixing, um, curating playlists and tunes, trying to suit a vibe, which is like what a lot of being a DJ is about. It's kind of, you know, having your own sound, developing that and kind of trusting what you know and what you think will work 
but then when you're like in a venue in a club or at a, at a festival you have to know you know you're working with the crowd and you've got to be intuitive to that energy and like work off other people see what are they enjoying what's like the vibe of the of the whole place right now what's come before you what's come after you um which is like another way that kind of works when you're doing radio shows like you know thinking just about what you're kind of leaving behind what you're um creating in anticipation of something else so also just like in sound it's like a really diverse industry and like if you learn kind of a few different skills you can become really self-sustainable so you know um i kind of learned with like physical production with using microphones different types of equipment with hardware and also with software with post production and so when you learn things like this you know you learn about cables you learn about setting things up you can basically like sound tech um when you're in post production you're learning about EQ you're learning about levels these things come in really handy you know you need them for radio for podcasting for music for DJing really like transferable skills um that you can bring and and you know that you can kind of rely on yourself also like if you're in a venue um if you could do the sound checking and do the DJing and you know it's people who can kind of rely on you a little bit more um and it just i think it kind of in like a professional sense it can like boost your value because you you know you really know like your field um and it's like a really interesting thing to learn about because like people you know will spend years and decades doing one particular thing in like the audio field so you know that there's always more to learn and people are also like quite nice they'll let you shadow them there's a lot of like free work which is like what we're trying to get away from but there is such value in like doing volunteering and in watching people and just asking questions you know being vulnerable and having humility because you know it is quite a nice field you know i know that like with music and stuff it can get a little bit difficult and um when whenever you get into kind of like an entertainment industry it it can be a little bit yeah there's not always like nice people but um if you kind of i don't know you you kind of find the good people people that are willing to help um and that you can give back to um so i guess um talking about audio like a way that i use uh, audio is uh, i started to get kind of scared that like my family history and these stories if i didn't record them they would just disappear and i knew that if i didn't do it in my generation nobody else in my family would do it so i started um it was mostly working with my grandma and just recording things um but then kind of i would make mixes and then find like really nice melodies where i could insert say like a recording of her giving me like a coffee cup reading and it's just like an interesting way of blending like different uses of sound um and you know you can do that for a mix online for a radio show at a gig um and it's just kind of the way that you want to express yourself and like sound is such an open platform for that really and there's so many different ways that you can use it um then i also wanted to talk about like there's a lot of of places and uh companies and groups at the moment that are like really focused on skill sharing and um that's why you know this also this whole experience with Tour de Moon is amazing because it's encouraging people to be creative collaborative to learn new things for people to come together and share what they know um and to help each other out you know because we we're all creative we all need ways of expressing that and like you go said that is a way of healing as well which is important and we should be true to that um i just wanted to name a few so for example saffron records they're like a music tech initiative they do a lot of workshops and programs um azima is a print magazine and a platform uh exploring women and non-binary folk within western asia north africa uh and south asia and uh they have hosted dj workshops and i'm sure they plan to do them again in the future and uh multitrack is uh, an incredible charity that give emerging uh bame audio producers professional placements and training um 
and like I, I was a multi-track fellow this year and it really like I think the kind of level of confidence because people sometimes they get a bit nervous about like when you can call yourself an artist or when you can call yourself a professional and how much work have you done to kind of validate that label that you're giving yourself um, so there's a lot of these networks now that like for free they, they give you this opportunity and it's not just that they're teaching you how to they're teaching you a skill, they're showing you how to use hardware, they're giving you a community of people like at your level that you can ask questions to, but then they're also giving you people at a higher level that you can ask questions to and that can, you know, maybe help you get into the industry, maybe get gigs or things like that. Um, and with like DJing and with music, it's difficult because you need things that are expensive. You need microphones, you need software. These things cost money, you need decks. They're, you know, it's at least a couple hundred pounds. Um, so then you have places like Pirate Studios um, that allow you to go in there and they have equipment for you. And it's still a little bit difficult because you need to know kind of, you know, how to turn this thing on and that. But that it is a place to start and it kind of lets you understand what you need to learn in order to get to like where you want to be. Um, so yeah, I guess just like get involved with people, like reach out to radio stations, try and get a show on there, um, practice, you know, if you need to have like kind of a, a, a deadline, then a radio station is really good for that because you have to get something in by a deadline, you're doing something consistently, consistently, yeah. Um, you know, you're curating something um, and reach out to, you know, other artists, you know, if somebody's emerging, maybe they need a DJ, maybe you can DJ for them. Or like Lisa was saying, you can find a collective, maybe you're doing kind of similar music and you can say, hey, like, do you need an opening set or a closing set? And um, it's not just a way of like getting jobs, but it's also like, making connections and like building that network which is so important um and that is yeah like how you how you grow and how you thrive and how you build like a sustainable career out of something that also gives you like value that gives you creative outlet um and so yeah so you know like apply for things meet up with people try and get into these workshops and if there's something like if there's not a workshop near you then you know that's also something you can apply for for a grant or to to get involved with other people so that you can provide something that gives back to your community um and yeah thanks for having me thank you so much olivia hugo and Lisa. we're gonna move to the kind of the conversation moment of this uh of this all thing uh, so if you have any question, I don't know who is here, please do uh, put them into the chat section. Otherwise, we're going to discuss together about actually. So Mike, I, we understand, you know, from all of you, fine. She was already doing this before, but uh, and as in, you know, it just happens that this track really became like the one and only on every single Christmas. But can I just say, like, is there, do we think that there is a way that we can kind of, you mentioned Spotify, uh, Lisa, and we all discuss a bit about, about you all use Spotify as well in your practice. But uh, I remember actually talking to a friend of mine that was in a &R, where they pick, you know, and they select people for uh, recording. And they, this guy was telling me that he picked this band because he managed to hack the algorithm of Spotify and make their track become number one in Sweden for more than like, I don't know how many, I can't remember the name of the band, but you just sign them on that basis. And I think that was quite interesting to think about the way that you can hack these things as well to get your music being heard or force your music to be heard. I don't know if this is something that you're doing. Was it ABBA? No, it wasn't ABBA. <laughs> <laughs> because they're trying to, to hack the, the system by going on to TikTok really aggressively and then making a lot of TikTok content and TikTok and Spotify are going crazy with ABBA. They send me emails and notifications every day that ABBA does something. It's like an old man sitting behind a mixing deck. Look at it. You have to look at it now. So I think, yeah, yeah, you have to, you know, make friends with the people at uh, TikTok or, or, or Spotify or anything interesting but it's it's really difficult to to uh, hack 
Spotify. It used to be in the Netherlands, at least, it used to be much easier because there was actually an actual person that that made the playlist. So uh, I had an email address that I could just send things to with a story and everything. And now it's just uh, kind of a generic uh, kind of field uh, thing that you have to fill in uh, and you have to sub submit your music. And um, if you're doing something out of the ordinary or so they don't know who you are and you're independent, then you're uh, kind of at the bottom of the priorities. Um, so you have to really stand out in a way. Um, so I think what Lisa said is um, if, if they see that there's a lot of buzz going around your music on social media or anything that really helps but uh, um, otherwise it could be good to uh, I used to work with a label that you that works like a really small label and they work with a bigger label that uh, the only thing that they did was um, actually submit my music to Spotify so it looked like a big label submitted my music so then it got it on the good playlist um, and that's the only thing they did. It was like uh, it was it's, it was fake, but uh, it worked. So maybe something like that uh, is good to work out. <laughs> I think my only like two cents on this whole thing is, I think um, if you're an artist trying to like come up and do music, like obviously I just did this whole presentation about like tri tips and tricks and stuff you need. But at the end of the day, like if you make music and art that you would consider meaningful and has a statement and is important to you and <clears throat> you would consider like this is like okay or like good music um honestly just keeping on doing it and like olivia was saying like building community you will at some point get like the energy that you put into your art back to you um like a lot of artists also become really big on Spotify and don't make money two years later and are not really valued because they, I guess, hack the system, but nobody, they don't have anything to fall back upon. Um, me and Mickey Blanco actually did a really interesting kind of like interview about this on Tidal uh, that you can probably find somewhere on YouTube about just organic growth and, um, I mean, hacking systems, cool. Like we should try it. Like make a dance on TikTok to your song and get people to collaborate and that's gonna give you streams, obviously. But at the end of the day, like uh, definitely make your art in a way that it has a message, it's important to you. You have a statement that other people can like, you know, find themselves in and your music will eventually be streamed and maybe not in two years or three years, but in 10 years, at least it will still be there and have a meaning and be relevant to people. And um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, I think uh, if I can say something about that, I think the hacking part is really, um, is getting a direct, uh, relationship to your community um, because like for instance Instagram my community is mainly on Instagram and on Spotify but on Spotify they're totally uh, I don't know who they are because I just see the number of followers but I don't know who these people are um, but on Instagram I, I have, have had a lot of conversations with these people but still when you post something to Instagram maybe 10% 5% of the people who are following you actually see what you're doing um, so I think the hack would be to kind of start your own uh, way of communicating with your with your audience, with your community. For instance, the I think the best way is with uh, with your own newsletter or something like that, or a Discord server, uh, things like that, that you can actually have a, a direct conversation with people. Um, it's so much more meaningful, and people will really people will like it. You will like it. I think it, it works better either way. Just to Kind of block out uh, the big tech kind of companies but still you need them but uh, i mean ideally you could sell your own music through like bandcamp or something um just promote it on discord and send out newsletters and i think that would be um maybe that's what i'm gonna do so nice olivia do you want to add anything to this um, I don't think so, really. I feel like I'm I'm coming from from a different angle. Um, 
without having actually, you know, I don't have anything on Spotify. I get you, um, Hugo, when you're saying like you have that kind of Instagram community and I think it's interesting like the ways that we kind of build these like invisible communities almost like, okay, yeah, there's the people that you know that follow you and then you get some random people. Um, but yeah, it's it's just weird sometimes, you know, kind of the reliance, I guess, that we have on these platforms um, where we're putting all of our work and we're, we're kind of pouring ourselves into their online, you know, what if they disappear in one moment, all of our work is kind of gone. Um, and they can be really communal and lovely. And for the most part, they are, but they can also be like quite isolating because, you know, at the end of the day, like it is just you making that. And until you're in a room and you're playing your stuff and things, which we haven't been able to for a while, you do kind of realize, um, I guess, the reality of like making stuff, which I guess brings it back to Liz's point is that you've got to make it for you. Like you can't be making it for other people because at the end of the day, like it is just, it's just you behind that screen, isn't it, on that account? And you've got to believe in that to keep going and, and to have that yeah belief in your support that you're doing it for the right reasons. And can we speak about, uh, thank you so much, Olivia, and actually super interesting point about the disappearance of this platform, because of course we all have experienced the end of Facebook and all of the WhatsApp and everything. Like I'm sure all of your music was down as well. Was it the situation or I actually, it wasn't YouTube and so forth, but yeah, it's uh, it was an interesting moment uh, to experience. Can we speak about merch? Are merch? you doing merch? Yes. Like, you know, how to make a tune like Maya Carey. I mean, Maya Carey got the fashion pretty much sorted, like, you know, the rollerblade, the, you know, the kind of like, no, nah, nah, nah. maybe that's a new, another one, but you know what I mean? Like merch and so forth. Is that something that you use as well to support your practice? How do you, you know, are we going to just, we have eight minutes to kind of like, merch and christmas obviously i know you go you have always a christmas jumper but yeah i think um just coming back to my previous point um maria carey of, of course is just a huge artist with a, with a lot of marketing money behind it like uh this week i saw in the new music friday i saw a, a christmas single by elton john and ed sheeran i was i don't think i've ever been this bored in my life uh, of course, if you're famous, you have a lot of money, you have a lot of followers, people will listen to, to the song that you, like ABBA, like push through their throats. Um, but if you're like an independent artist, I think um, if you sell a song, like I said, on Bandcamp for five euros a person, that is, then you're making a thousand times more money, literally, uh, than you do on Spotify. So also merch is uh, a way to really of course, easily connect to your audience. Uh, and it's, I mean, the profit from Spotify and streaming is so, so little um, that of course, uh, so I make a Christmas sweater each year. I've been doing that for four years or something. And, and it's just really nice. Like today I, I saw a, a clip of an actress on TV and she was wearing my Christmas sweater. And I was like, I made that three years ago and she's really happy with it. She wears it like, every week and it's much more visible than my Christmas single from that year so of course I think as an artist you shouldn't limit yourself to music but it's it's kind of selling or selling not not really selling but you know um, getting across what you want to get across to people and the feeling you want to want people to have and uh, that's I think the most important thing so I really agree also with uh, Lisa on, on that yeah this is one thing I would like to add it's that obviously this is all a lot of information and a lot of things and you know obviously Hugo, Olivia and I are all people who have been I guess in the creative and music industry for quite uh, I, I would say a few years every single one of us. Um, I just really want to stress out that um, the music industry in general is uh, a very um, it's a very difficult space to really break through when you don't come from wealth or like nepotism or don't have a lot of privileges. I think like success, I think the percentage of successful people within creative industry that are from working class families is like 16%, one six. Um, so 
if you're a musician by yourself, supporting yourself, um, making it work for yourself, don't feel discouraged or sad because you see like other people attaining things that maybe you haven't attained yet within a few years. Um, honestly, if you build community and you do what you love, at the end of the day, like those things will matter a lot more. And there is definitely a chance for your music to break through as well. Like don't feel like because the stacks are, you know, it's like stacked up against you that you can't get there. But I just wanna really pinpoint for people and especially within the pandemic that it's okay for you to take time for yourself. It's okay if you haven't released a song yet because you're working every day. Uh, it's okay if you haven't been able to do certain things to position yourself or you haven't been able to you know travel to a certain city yet um don't be too hard on yourself i guess that's just like one of the things i wanted to say because these presentations can be very um sometimes it's like what am i doing uh and like whatever you're doing is fine take this with a grain of salt obviously um yeah. Thank you so much for all of your word of wisdom, everyone. I just, I'm going to end by asking you all to just like Christmas. What are we listening this Christmas? Okay, Olivia, what do you listen for Christmas? Tell me. Okay, so I've been realizing that I don't really like Christmas that much. Um, because, yeah, I don't know, like I, my family always play like the same old Christmas tunes. But actually recently uh, I found like an Armenian one. and I'm going to post the link in the chat. Um, and it, there's like the, the translation in the um, in the caption or in the in the description below. So this is what I'm going to listen to this year. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll play What's that. Called? What is it called for those that are not in the chat? Because, of course, we're going to put that on YouTube and you're going to be like, you know, millions of you. So of what's course. the name of the, you know, because we like to hack algorithm at the University of the Underground. <laughs> of course, it's called Kef Kef Celebration, and it's a Christmas song by the Armenian Navy Band. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Olivia. Okay, Lisa, you go. Who wants to give me the, what we listening for Christmas? Um, Azealia Banks has a really good mini EP <laughs> that's a Christmas EP it's called I See Colors Change and it's her like rapping and singing uh, Christmas songs <laughs> brilliant well so my favorite Christmas song uh, but it's really uh, not pandemic friendly because it's super hyperactive but there is a it turned 10 years old this year there's a, a nightcore remix of All I Want For Christmas Is You on YouTube uh, and it's it's like a trans, super uh, extremely fast, um, high pitched version of All I Want for Christmas is You, and it makes me really happy. So that's what I'll <laughs> listen to. Brilliant. Thank you so much to you all. And we hope to see you at Tour de Moon as well. I think, you know, if there is a way that we can collaborate with all of you, then we're definitely going to make that happen. We're so grateful for your time and for sharing your wisdom and your experience of going through this industry uh, and uh, thank you so much 